Hi there, I'm Colin Klupik, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how to make this small step stool. Now, there are heaps of these in woodworking books and even more on YouTube, but I'm gonna be talking about it from the perspective of a teacher and how you might work through this as a design project with a class. So if you're a teacher looking for a design project to do with your class, then you might find this video helpful. Now, first off, we need to actually get some materials, and this is made of timber. And you often say to students in a design class, oh, you need to go and do the research. You need to go and find the materials and bring them into class. That's one thing to say that, but it's another thing to actually go through the process yourself, rather than just conveniently going into the storeroom and saying, oh look, here's some timber that was ordered for me or was provided for me. So why don't we go through that process of having to go and source it and choose it and bring it home ourselves? In fact, let's do that now. Well, here we are in a reputable hardware store where there's a ready supply, a plentiful supply of this kind of timber. But just because they're all stacked up here doesn't mean that they're all going to be the same or that they're all good. And I've actually been known to pull an entire timber stack apart just to try and find the right piece that I'm after. Taking a whole bunch of timber off the shelf to get the piece you're after can look a little bit strange. But you're the one paying for it, so you may as well choose something that's going to be just right. And students often feel really dudded when they bring in a piece of timber that's bowed or defected in some way, especially when they simply accept what they're given. I think that's the one. Now, to make sure that you don't upset everyone, just make sure you put all the other ones that you rejected back in the pile. It's no fun being seen as a troublemaker and then being chased out of the store. And if you do this in a friendly manner, you're much less likely to get frowned upon or yelled at. Now this is another example of what I was talking about. I've just put my camera down on this thing which they call a pine handy panel. Well, it looks very handy. Check this out. So that's actually a really nice piece of timber, but when you look at it on edge, check this out. That thing's as curved as a banana. Now, that's $149 a panel. If you're gonna pay for that, you wanna make sure it's nice and flat. So these ones down here, these ones down here are a lot flatter. Would I pull this one off to get to all these ones down here? Yeah, you bet I would. Just like I did with that one over there. So we also need some 42 by 19 and these are notoriously bad for being like bananas more than timber. Don't like my chances, but here we go. Actually, that one's pretty good on the second go. Actually, to be fair, the quality is usually pretty good, but it always pays to check. Look what I just found. A round vintage step stool with a powder coated steel frame, maximum load rating 100 kilos, and an MDF top with timber look vinyl wrap. There's a timber look vinyl wrap. $25. Why would you bother teaching anyone to do anything? and I could buy one of these for $25. I can barely buy the timber for that much. Have a look at this. $25 in round or square. That's a bargain. That's something you have to ask yourself. Why would you teach students how to make stuff when you can just buy stuff it's very confusing. Wow. Oh look, they've got different coloured ones over there. Let's have a look. Same product. Lighter colour. Same price. $25. Look what I made, sir. Gee, I'm about to cause a mess. There we go. Wow. That's conflicting. Should we still be teaching these skills? I've been to the hardware so many times to get materials for my classes, usually at the end of the day as you can see here, and that goes for other suppliers as well. Now I don't suggest you do this every time because it can be very inefficient. One thing is for sure, going through the experience yourself is a valuable thing to do. So the timber I've ended up selecting is radiata pine. This is 235 wide by 19 millimeters thick. And the reason why I choose this is because it's readily available. And that's why I go to the reputable hardware store that I was at, because you can usually always find it there rather than having to go to a specialist timber supplier. Generally, the quality is pretty good, I'd have to say, except sometimes 
the narrow ones can be really, really bendy, kind of like a banana. One of the things I like about making a project like this with students is that it's very simple and you can get success really quickly. That's why I like to have this very simple prototype handy because you can easily see that it's just four bits of timber uh, with some joining methods. And uh, so the first thing that we have to do is cut our timber and we'll cut the two legs and the top. I'm using my Festool MFT table and a track saw to make these cuts. You might use a drop saw or miter saw as some people like to call them. And to make this design a little bit more interesting, we're actually going to taper the legs. And that's one of the advantages of buying the stock timber at 235 millimeters wide and making the overall dimension of the project 230 because it means you have to make it just that little bit narrower. And it means you can introduce another process for students to learn. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use a jack plane. Marking out the taper on the legs is quite simple. I'm coming in 10 millimeters from each side and simply ruling a line back to the corner on the other end. I'm doing this on both sides of the timber so I can keep track of how much I'm planing off as I begin to plane. It also helps to mark off the edge between the two faces to stop you from planing down too far, and it makes the wedge shape of the taper much more obvious. Then begin to plane away the timber, starting from the thick end first and then flattening the plane out as you start to make some progress. To get really nice even shavings like these, you'll need a good planing action and a really nice sharp plane blade. Yes, I go on a bit about sharp plane blades, but it really is essential for achieving good results and for being less irritating. The top also needs to be a bit narrower. I need to remove five millimeters to make the top 230 millimeters wide. And this time there is no taper in the planing action. Now that we have a top and two sides, I need to mark out the hand grip. And for that, I'm going to use this template that I made earlier. This will allow me to use a router to create a nice clean slot cut. Simply align the two pieces and trace out the hole. If you want to make this more challenging, you could always get students to mark out the slot position using a ruler. Now there are several ways that you might approach cutting out this hole. Usually what you might do is drill a hole here and maybe then drill a hole there and then use a jigsaw to cut out most of the waste and then come back with a flush trim router bit and then run the flush trim router bit around that nice edge and then clean up the edge in the actual piece of timber, which is this one here. Uh, I'm not going to use a jigsaw, I'm going to use this Forstner bit here to make two holes at either end of the slot and then I'm just going to do another couple of holes uh, in between those just to take most of the material out and the reason why I'm doing that is to try and reduce the number of processes involved in this project. Now if you've got more advanced students or you'd like to include more processes then you could just drill two holes and then use a jigsaw on top of that. Make sure the workpiece is securely clamped to the bench and then use a simple battery drill and forcing bit combination to take out most of the waste. Just don't get too close to the pencil line. This can be a messy process, so having a vacuum handy is a good idea. Once the holes are cut, place the timber back over the template and prepare for routing out the rest. I'm using a flush trim bit, which will trace the smooth profile underneath and take out any waste that is above it. Out of all the router bits available, I think the flush trim bit is probably the most useful it pays to invest in a good quality one. Then carefully rat out the waste. Good dust extraction and a steady action are really important here, and you should be able to achieve an excellent result. That's just the right size for a hand grip. Once the students have reached this stage, they've got two ends and a top, and a lot of the hard work's been done already. And now's a good time for them to think back to what kind of edge treatment they wanted to use. Do they want to leave a nice 90 degree well-defined edge or do they maybe want to use a roundover bit on a router and create a nice smooth rounded edge? And the same goes for the hand grip in the middle. You could use a small trimmer, as in a small roundover bit in a trimmer and make a nice rounded edge inside there. Or you could just use a simple piece of sandpaper just to take that harsh edge off. And so you get a nice 90 degree profile all the way around. I'm gonna leave mine as close to 90 degrees as possible and just take off that sharpness. And before I sand the edges, I'm going to plane off the corner and create a tiny chamfer. Not too much though, because I like a nice square edge. Now we also need a cross brace. And for that, I'm gonna go back to the track saw. I can set the seven degree angle easily using the protractor on the MFT table. If you're wondering, yes, this is every bit as good as the angle adjustment on a miter saw. In fact, I think it's much more versatile. I just love it. And there we have our two seven degree cuts to give us the cross brace. 
and for this demo I'll quickly give all faces a sand at 120 grit only, as it was quite smooth to begin with. Now looking ahead in this project, one of the hard things is um, once you've got these sloping sides going and then you want to put a top on, how do you how do you hold it all together without it falling down? And I still need to mark out the holes for where the screws go in the top, so what do I do? Well, you might be wondering, what is this thing actually sitting on? Well, this is a jig. I made this jig which uh, simulates the sides of the stool, so these are cut to seven degree slopes, which means that all I need to do is place the sides into the jig, like this, and then using a very simple and cheap spring clamp, only a few dollars, I can actually hold the sides into the jig and then the whole thing stands up by itself without any glue or screws and then I can prepare it nicely for assembly. There you go. So now the top goes on and now I can align all of that without having to think about it too much because it's not going to fall over. So the next part is I need to find out where these screw holes go and I kind of know where they need to go. They need to go about this far in and then probably about 40 millimeters in from each end. And I know that sounds very uh, non-exact, but uh, by evening this up now, I can use a ruler and just measure out an even distance on both sides, front and back and left and right. And then I can mark out where the screw holes go. Kind of handy. So I definitely recommend a jig. And why is the jig up on stilts like this? Well, you'll see that when I go to clamp it together. Whilst the pieces are secured in the jig, I can mark out where all the holes go and make sure it's all evenly located, side to side and front to back. When everything is in position, I can mark out where the holes need to be drilled. I'm using 10 gauge anodized timber screws with a countersunk head, and I'll drill a four and a half millimeter clearance hole for them to pass through. I'm using a rose countersink to ensure the screw heads sit just under the surface. I need to be careful using this tool because it's easy to make the countersink too small or too large. Sometimes you get a nice round smooth profile like this one. Other times you suddenly get a rather rough looking profile like this and that can look quite bodgy. Whoa, hello. So um, at this stage I've sanded it and it's ready to go and I've drilled the holes but we will also need to put this bit in which is the cross brace that kind of fits in underneath here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to drill these in, these screws, but I'm going to use small screws, little 25mm screws, just so that the top gets held into the sides. That will allow me to tip it upside down, mark out where the holes need to go for this cross brace, because that's going to have to get screwed in from the side, and uh, then I can put the whole thing back together with longer screws and glue. And I might even paint it. Hmm. This is where the raised jig becomes useful. It allows me to easily place clamps on the job to hold it all steady before driving in the screws. It really is worth the effort to make a jig like this one as it makes the process so much easier. Then align the cross brace so that it sits evenly. And using the same procedure, mark out the holes, drill, countersink, and then secure the cross brace with small screws. And there it is, ready for gluing and screwing together with longer screws. It's starting to look good but there's one detail I haven't addressed yet, and that's the extra profile cut on the base of the legs. For that, I'll use my flush trim bit again and make a very simple cutout profile. This is a great view of how the flush trim bit actually works. And there we go, a little bit more detail in the, uh, the base of the leg there. It makes it look like it's got four feet. And that's a nice, neat profile that you can do with a router and a flush trim bit. Now, of course, there are loads of options here. You could use a bandsaw or you could use a jigsaw and you could cut a nice arc in there to give it two little feet on the end. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff you could do to make it more intricate and more complicated. But uh, I quite like that. I think that's a very simple profile. I think that'll look really good. I think I will paint it. Maybe I'll paint it a cheeky festal green. Is there a festal green? Now because I'm using 10 gauge screws, I'm drilling a pilot hole for each screw at three and a half millimeter diameter to avoid any timber splitting. Students might get a bit impatient with this process and just drive the screw in anyway, but that's likely to cause problems, so it's good to encourage this process. Then apply glue to the contacting surfaces and slowly drive each of the screws into place. Drive them in evenly to avoid any misalignment 
or uneven tension in the job. Wipe off excess glue. Remove from the jig. Repeat the pilot hole process for the cross brace and then carefully drive in the 10 gauge screws. Ensure you put enough glue on the end of the cross brace. You'll notice I'm using a clamp here as a spreader to help locate the cross brace without making the glue go everywhere. This process can be a bit slippy. The pilot holes are also really important here because 10 gauge screws will easily split the 42 mm wide piece without them. Now, the truth of the matter is, I couldn't decide whether to paint or not for this demonstration. So, I made two. Here's the raw version. I actually like it without any finish applied to it. Yeah, I know it's green. It's festal green, isn't it? Actually, this is green that I had left over from another job where I was using a spray can. I would never suggest using spray paint in a school unless you've got all the right setup for it in terms of extraction and WHS safety and all the rest of it. Otherwise, it just adds a whole layer of complexity that you really don't need. Uh, but this is just a very simple gray paint as well. This, I just um, used a roller to apply that. Uh, it's a water-based paint, so quite safe to use uh, in a classroom situation. Uh, and of course, this is the uh, what I call the Wood Tech Clear or the raw version underneath. So if you like the look of pine, well, there's no reason for, for painting it. But if you like to add a bit of color and a little bit of spice, well, sure, why not, right? Add a bit of color. So despite the fact that this project is really common and actually quite simple, I think it still has a lot to offer. And that's because it's really practical. I think everyone could probably afford to be about that much taller every now and again. Uh, even my kitchen has kitchen cabinets that are too high for me to reach, and I'm 193 centimeters tall, or six foot four for you uh, imperial people out there. So a project like this can be scaled up or down in terms of its complexity, uh, depending on the class that you have, or perhaps even the year group that you're teaching. And it can also help you to introduce uh, concepts like the design and manufacture of things like this, like a jig, so that you can increase production and you can talk about mass production or making, making things simple or automating processes, stuff like that. So the humble step stool, I recommend you uh, think about that for your classes and have a go at making one of these yourself because even if you never teach it, even if you never run through it with a class, you might end up using it, like in the kitchen, where there's always a cupboard that is just a bit too high. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.